Welcome to the Find the Way podcast. In this show, we will try to explore what is happening in emerging markets and how entrepreneurs, investors, and communities are simply finding the way to make phenomenal things happen, regardless how volatile the environment may sometimes seem. It is so fascinating for me to see that a lot of people have not visited their neighboring countries in Latin America. And I'm heading down to Bolivia on Sunday. And I talk to people here in Argentina, and I, I haven't really met anybody from Argentina who has been to Bolivia. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, Bolivia, for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, it's very interesting. More people probably travel from the South America to North America or Europe. Yeah, well, what's, what's the reason? For what? The trips are quite long. So if I go to Brazil, it's like five hours. And mm-hmm. if I go to Miami, it's also five hours. Um, second, probably family. There's, yeah, yeah. There has been a lot of migration from South America to the USA. So a lot of people travel to the USA because they have family there. Um, and then, I don't know. I mean, I've been to Chile like twice. And, no, but one, but very small time, like three days, two days. I never had a like, hey, let's plan a holidays in Chile. Argentina is different. Argentina went to Argentina twice, but for kind of yeah. hanging around. Yeah. Brazil went one. Colombia, I went for a wedding. I went for vacation with friends, with Colombian friends, and then I think an additional trip. I went to Ecuador because of work. And for vacation once with my father a long time ago, never been to Bolivia, yeah. never been to Paraguay or Uruguay either. But yeah, yeah, I know. Maybe we we prefer to go further. Just keep going further, further along the way. And it's been also intriguing for me to see that. Just to get, take an example, that I I flew from a bachelor party in Berlin last May in 22 to Croatia to split with less than 50 euros one way. And when you buy tickets here in, in South America, they're just out of control, some of the prices, yeah. compared to compared to what I used to... Compared to Europe, yeah. Europe is, I mean, Europe is the cheapest. And yeah. not even in the US, you get that cheaper than Europe. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's more traffic to the U.S., so you can get cheap tickets to the U.S. sometimes, like $500 or even less, $300, $400. The Caribbean also is a good place to, to, to spend time, so I think probably we, we travel a lot to the Caribbean too. Yeah, it, that's another paradise. Really, really need yeah. to explore that a little bit more. But cool. Um, should. Okay. Let's get started. I'm super excited to have you here, Jose. You have a lot of valuable perspectives that you can provide from Peru and from Peruvian ecosystem. And you've been playing the game over there for a long time. So thanks for joining today. Thank you, Eric, for the invitation. It's glad to be here. Would you be able to give a little intro to you and, and what have you been up to in, in, in the past years? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm the managing director of Youth Adventures. So for the last Five years I have been running uh, investment programs, mainly acceleration programs to invest in a startup, but mainly to support the local ecosystem and help Peruvian entrepreneurs create awesome companies and, 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 and grow those companies, not only in Peru, but internationally. Nice. And how's the situation over there? Has it been booming? What has been happening in the past 10 years in terms of the tech ecosystem in, in Peru, um, it's still relatively nascent compared to the other major markets in, in Latin America. So could you share us a little bit what's going on? Yeah. So first, the ecosystem probably was born 10 years ago only. So it's ah, quite okay. new, still new. It uh, probably, I think, all started in 2012. So it's new. It has been growing fast. Go you know, and uh, it has been growing fast because the whole region is growing fast from startups and and ventures. We have been hit hard by the pandemic, like, like most ecosystems. But also after the pandemic, we got some political issues, and and those have those issues have affected the ecosystem too. So I will say that between 2020 and 2022, it has been hit 
by the political recession and, and pandemia. But we are gain, gain, gaining track again. And I think the Peruvian ecosystem has a lot of, of opportunities because it has been underlooked uh, compared to other, other ecosystems. Absolutely. And then if you would be able to, okay, you mentioned that the ecosystem was basically founded in 2012. Um, just to ask 2015 around there, how much investments into tech companies was Peru receiving at that stage compared to, let's say now? A lot. We don't have records from 2015 about investments. <laughs> or, <laughs> okay. From one point of view, I mean, we cannot say how much. But if you can give ballpark estimates, ballpark estimates. We have from 2017. Okay. And, and from 2017, it was like $10 million. The whole venture capital market was $10 million. And now we're talking about $100 million. So it has multiplied by 10 in the last five years. That's incredible. That's incredible. It is. It, it still, when you see the chart, in, in LATAM, you see like markets that are above a billion or hand, uh, hundreds of million. We're still below, but I, th- yeah. I, as I just mentioned, it's because we're under look and, 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 and there are a lot of opportunities. Absolutely. And, and, but okay, that's 10 X growth that has already taken place. And do you have any, any numbers from 22? I know we're now heading towards end of January in 23, but is there any numbers from last year? So we don't have the final data, like how did the year end that? Um, 2021, the whole BC market was above 120 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the first semester of last year, we were uh, growing compared to the first semester of 2021. And uh, I will, I mean, my guesstimate will be that we will be between 120, maybe between 100 and 150 for 2022. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I don't expect a big, a big, a big, uh, uh, a big um, growth compared to the 2021 because 2022 had been a hard year for the VC market all over the world. Yeah. Uh, maybe it will surprise me and we get 200 <laughs> or more. Yeah, true, true that. And if you would be able to also elaborate about the landscape, is there a lot of VCs involved? You're also an accelerator and a fund. You invest roughly 50K tickets into, into the organizations that you're willing to support. Is there a lot of activity, a lot of players also involved? in the Peruvian game? There are a lot of international players involved. That's one mm-hmm. of the, probably the difference to other markets. So most of the investment is driven by international investors. I will mm-hmm. say maybe 80, 80%, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I will say probably 80% is international investment. So that makes us also different. That creates a, a, a challenge for our founders because they need to be regional since the beginning. They need to start to look internationally since the beginning. We invest, as you mentioned, early stage. So that we are kind of our the first investors in most Peruvian startups and and that helped them like validate locally, but also start making connections internationally. And also that's one of our main um main support is help them make these networks internationally. Yeah. And from there, would you be able to also give a little glimpse on what are you then really doing in Tech Ventures? When were you founded and what has been going on on there? Yeah, we started in 2015. So we have been around for seven years. We have supported more than 70 companies. We invested in half of them. The reason mm-hmm. we invested just in half is that we stopped investing during the pandemic, but we have again started investing last year. So, or restarted. And, um, and what we do, we, so we work with founders who have at least a product or a service created. They already have a few initial clients. Um, and we help them get to the product market fit as soon as possible. We help them validate the business model. We help them fundraise. So 50% of our companies raise around six months after the program, usually an angel round. Those rounds right now are between 200K up to probably half a million K. They raise that round and then we 
continue working with them to toward the next stages. And those stages obviously require more funding, but also what I mentioned, they require them to start making those contacts internationally for most of the cases in order to get those rounds closed. One of the challenges we still have being a small ecosystem, just a hundred million Batman, mainly focused of internet, mainly, I mean, uh, those, those investments are mainly from international funds. One of the challenges is that, yeah, it's difficult to close. It's still difficult to close a pre-seed or seed round locally. So you need international investment. Yeah. And how many local players are involved? It's you. You've been there, a major contributor to the ecosystem. Is there other VCs that are investing in, in the region? So there are a few VCs. Uh, there are micro VCs. There will be like two or three micro VCs. Those who make checks between 50K, maybe up to 100, 150. Uh, then we have one main VC. It's called Psych. Uh, they actually, it's quite new too, because that can be closed their, their fund last year. So even before that, we didn't have a major VC. Now we have one VC, one Peruvian VC. We are, we are, we're glad of that. And, um, and, and from the accelerator part, we are the only accelerator that invests in startups. And then we have angel networks and mm -hmm. we have probably around five angel networks. And that would be the local venture market. Yeah, it's quite small, still small. Still small, but it's it's going to inevitably keep keep going into a larger stage. And the good thing is being a small, you can grab the best opportunity. So, yeah. Agreed. And on talking about opportunities, what are the major trends that are now that you're seeing um, from, from the organization that people are, the entrepreneurs, what type of products are you developing in what industry verticals? What is booming in Peru right now? So Peru, the biggest startups have been around education, ed tech, probably. I don't know what led because one of the big, the, I mean, the, probably one of the biggest startups, one of the biggest Peruvian startups is Kriana. That's marketplace for an e-learning solution, mm -hmm. B2B, B2C solution. And they, now they they raised up to uh, their last round was around 70 million. So they went to all the way to series B and uh, probably that has motivated a lot of other founders to create ethic because we have very successful ethic started. So one trend is, is ethic solution. And also, I mean, education is a big thing in, in Latin America. I mean, we still need to make stronger educational systems. And in that sense, uh, I think also that back up why there are so many ethic solutions. Then uh, the other successful startups um, or the other interesting sectors is fintech. Uh, most, I think most Latin American countries, fintech is a very active sector. We have a lot of, I mean, like 50% of Peruvians don't have access to a bank account, so they need authority solution. And probably just 20% have access to a credit card. So we also need solutions for that, but for both sides, not only for consumers, but also for online sales. I mean, if you need to sell yeah. online and only 20% of the population have credit cards, you need solutions for that. So that Absolutely. has helped create also uh, interest in fintech solutions. And other two markets that have not been exploited that much, but are very attractive and always very attractive. One is um, mining solutions. We are a mining country, so we have a lot of, 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 of probably the biggest mining players operating in Peru. So that's an interesting market. And the other one is agriculture and, and biodiversity and all the solutions around food. Uh, we are a, a main exporter, top exporter of, 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 of agricultural products. And, and we need solutions for the supply chain, for the production, for trading, for, so we are also have see a lot of opportunities there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And. What is the trajectory that you see that you mentioned over there about fintech is booming, edtech is booming? When you look at IMF and World Bank data regarding the GDP growth projections for, for Peru, the current status is, is, is a little bit over $6,000 US dollars GDP per capita, and it's going to be increasing and increasing, but still a big portion of 
the GDP roughly 40%, according to the estimates by IMF and World Bank, mentions that the growth will come from the informal economy. Do you see that these fintech, fintech solutions are really bringing these people into the formal economy or is, still, or is there still a lot of resistance? What's happening there? I mean, they, they need to be adapted to the informal economy. The informal economy is going to stay it's too difficult to, to change that from one day to another. It, it takes time to reduce informality. We have been dealing with that for years, for probably decades, and uh, hasn't changed that much. And um, there are some structural challenges that need to be changed, and, and that takes time and a lot of effort. So solutions, and, and, and that's one thing that's very interesting in Latin America, is that not only to prove the whole Latin America, is that you need solutions for that type of market. You need to know how to sell to people who don't have a fixed income, that don't have a credit card, that don't cannot get a mortgage, cannot have access to a mortgage. And, 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 and that makes local solutions different from international solutions. And that also have them have a captive market because it's difficult for international actors to compete in, uh, in Latin America, in Peru and other countries because they will need to adapt and it's very difficult to adapt. Mm. Uh, a case that is always, uh, it's got, it's like, you know, to say Spanish, Spanish startups, they have a lot of unicorns, very interesting ecosystem. They will jump to Latin America and, and, um, spread all over Latin America. And, and it, it sounds. Uh, like, oh, they speak the same language, right? I mean, yeah. it, it should work. It doesn't. It doesn't work. And it's very difficult because they need to understand that here. And even between Latin American countries, there are differences that need to be uh, under, understood in order to create a successful business. Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples of companies that are locally providing great, great ways to solve some of these problems and are addressing the needs of, of the people that are not part of the formal economy? Do you have any examples that technology is helping that sector? Sure. I mean, uh, there are a lot, but uh, uh, one that comes to my mind that I like a lot went to our, they went to our portfolio and, and, in, and they went to our program. They're part of our portfolio. They, they, it's called Agros, A-G-R-O-S. Uh, they won the MIT IAC International Contest. So they won all over the world, like one of the best solutions for inclusion. And what they do is they uh, try to connect rural farmers, rural workers to the economy by creating digital uh, ID. You know, even access for regular ID for those people is difficult. So if they are mm -hmm. trying to create an, uh, an digital identity so they can access market more easily. And they are mm -hmm. growing in rural areas, connecting those farmers and rural workers with providers, with financial market, creating this idea on blockchain. So that's one of one example. Another example, talking about EdTech, Laboratoria is one of also one of the, the main tech companies that has been, has attracted a lot of attention internationally. They also won this contest and, and what they do, they train female students on coding and trying to get them into the labor market, into a, not only labor market, but also into a well-paid labor market. Because usually we know women, especially they go, they work with women from, um, uh, from the bottom of the pyramid, from less uh, income households and, mm -hmm. and they have challenge to access to education and then they have a challenge to access labor market. So they are trying to solve those by including them into the economy. Um, as those, I mean, we, we have other, other solutions that are actually trying to solve those challenges we have in Latin America. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then if we take a look on Peru as a destination for foreign capital investments, what is the current status in Peru? Of course, there's a lot of volatility, like in, in, especially from the European or US lenses. What has been historically happening in, in Peru? The inflation has been actually pretty well controlled. When you look at the historical data, it's been relatively 
steady GDP growth coming from the region, would you be able to elaborate the current sure. status? Sure. So on the on the positive side, I mentioned that eighty percent of our startups are or our investment rounds are are are, are filled with international investors, and and that our founders need to understand that in the beginning. So the first good thing is that if you if if you invest in a proven startup, it's going to be a Delaware company. Yeah, <laughs> it's not going to be a. I mean, it it will have a Peruvian company at a subsidiary from the holding in the U.S. or Cayman or, or other regions, but they established in a well-known regulated market to get funding. So in that sense, you have all the protection as investing in any startup that is from Delaware or mm-hmm. of these other regions. And then, um, so locally, then you say, okay, yeah, they so invest in a Delaware company, but they operate in a very uh, informal market or challenging market. Yes, it's true. Um, the good thing is that we still, I hope we will continue, uh, promote, uh, we're market-oriented. We, prom- we protect investment locally. We, um, we need to generate employment. So we, as a country, have tried to establish a, a strong regulation around companies that generate employment. And um, and in that sense, for international investors, they will find that operating in Peru has a lot of advantages because there is low competition in the sense that not many risk uh, investors see Peru, they over, underlook Peru. So you will see a low competition, and in that sense, you will take the best opportunities in a very interesting side market. We have more than 30 million population, above 200 billion GDP. And uh, <clears throat> and in that sense, um, for me, it's great. I mean, uh, we see a, we, now we see a lot of Chilean, Colombian startups seeing Peru as their main destination because they see that their solution can be very, um, you know, they, I mean, they, they see there's no competition and they can get into the Peruvian market and access an, a very attractive market immediately. So again, I see, I, I, I think that investors don't need to worry about investing in Peruvian startup. Um, they will get all the upside of being the first mover in, a, in an underlooked market. Absolutely, absolutely. And is this one of the reasons why you have stayed in Peru? You did a little stunt by living in, in Europe and in the U.S., but then you returned back to Peru. Was this the reason or was there anything else to that? So you could, stayed, you could have I... stayed outside and enjoyed a very, very comfortable life, Different stable life, life yeah. but maybe you would have get bored, uh, gotten bored. The... So, yeah, I, I will miss the salsa and the spicy food. <laughs> no, kidding. Oh, the Peruvian One food is the, phenomenal. Uh, like, you, nobody can deny that. It's, it's, it's incredible. That's, that's uh, something that other regions have not yeah, been able to keep up we, with. Yeah, that's something we are very proud of. Um, so the reason why is I, I work at Youth Tech Ventures is because I believe in the mission we have of helping entrepreneurs creating great companies great tech companies in Latin America. We need that. We need to continue creating great tech companies in Latin America. And for me, the way I feel complete is when I see entrepreneurs growing. I see entrepreneurs raising funds, op- opening new markets, hiring people, growing, I mean, m- making their companies bigger. That for me is the main success indicator of everything I do at Utech Ventures. Mm-hmm. Even before return to capital. <laughs> yeah. I, I see. Yeah. Great. And then if we take a look on the industries that are, are booming, you mentioned ed tech, fintech, food tech, e commerce is all around Latin America growing, the, the pie is getting bigger. What is the level of talent in, in Peru? How just out of curiosity, like are the universities or people the necessary people that that can enable these new companies that are being built, and, or do they need to go outside of Peru to find that talent? What is the current situation over there, talent wise? 
I will say it's very similar. Uh, there is always a fight for talent in Peru, but at many countries, in, not only Latin America, internationally too. We see yeah. a lot of local developers, local engineers working for international companies. We see that more openly um, as the year passed by. So, so that, from one side, show us there is a car city of talent all over internationally, but also that our, our talent is as competitive as any other engineer or developer in any other region or developed region in the world. Um, univ- being from a university, I'm from an engineering university, so UTech Ventures is part of UTech. UTech is an engineering and technology university, and uh, we promote new talent in this field because we, we see a big opportunity there and because it's needed and there is a lot of demand. Our, as probably you will get, uh, our, our main or the career that it's, uh, our graduates are, are mostly demanded are computer science. I mean, everybody yeah. wants to hire our computer scientists, even, even before they graduate. I mean, they want them to, to, to start working with uh, tech companies. So there is good talent. There's becoming more and more uh, talent on the engineering and especially on the computer science and, and, and software um, sector. And, and we will continue producing that. We had a lot of companies that export uh, software and tech services internationally too. And one of the positive thing about that, or one of the positive things about importing it from Lima or from Peru is that we are in the same time zone as the U.S. market, so we can work remotely uh, with the same uh, schedule. And, mm-hmm. um, and in that sense, also, we have very, uh, we can coordinate better, but also Peru has still, still, I hope it will continue, uh, cheaper than a more developed market. So you can have access to great talent with a very competitive uh, cost. Yeah. Okay, that's computer science, but what is the status regarding more hard sciences or hard tech? Is everybody now being lured into from from the the younger population and the people who are heading towards and choosing tech as a cure, starting businesses or changing their corporate jobs to to technology companies? Is is there anything happening on on the hard sciences side in in Peru? That's moving slower. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is, again, talking again about UTEC, we have bioengineering as a career, and we also have a very good uh, uh, pool of students who are uh, becoming bioengineers, and, and obviously those, th- I mean, that's a talent that you're going to need, and you need now, and you're going to need the next year. And, but I would love to see it moving, moving faster, having more like, Scholarships for 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 young young adults getting to those mm-hmm. careers, right? Uh, it's difficult too because if you so if you don't have a good high school level or primary level on 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 science and math, then it becomes harder and harder. And when you get to those careers, it's all about science, and math, and 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 if you have if you haven't uh, understood correctly the basics of those of those subjects, it's going to be harder, and then it's going to be difficult that you will get into engineering or, or mm-hmm. those kind of careers. So, it I think we need to continue, and again, that comes back to ethics, right? Why there are so many ethics and uh, interesting ethics coming from Peru is because we still need to make stronger uh, programs on science and math in school in order to promote them to get into university. Yeah. We can accept at the university thousand of the students on engineering. We will not complain. <laughs> but the thing is, we need them to apply, right? In order for them to apply, they need to feel confident that that's what they want to do. And uh, in yeah. order to do that, they need to have a strong school education. And, and we need to improve that. And we need to continue promoting policy toward scholarships and, 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 and students getting them into, into more hard science careers. We also need to put more money on research 
kind of research is still one of you know, so re engineering or, or, or higher science research still low in Peru compared to other more developed, especially we compared to more developed countries. And so we need to continue putting money and funding those research centers on, on hard science in order to continue creating new things from Peru. Yeah, absolutely. Then what is the role of the government now? Is it supportive or is it fighting against this new technology development? Some of the countries are not as easy to operate, but is the government on the side of the Peruvian tech ecosystem? And if yeah. yes, how? So at least for the last years, it has been on the tech side. They obviously have like immediate demands they need to fulfill on education, health, intensive labor markets and culture, also infrastructure, but has been supported have been supportive for the tech ecosystem. We created a fund of funds, the first fund of funds from Peru, and 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 that again a final that the government wants to invest. On How big was that? Small. It is it is twenty million dollar fund of funds, so usually it's a small. But as I mentioned, I mean when they created the fund of funds, we I think it was even before we had a one BC. So uh, yeah. the Peruvian market was a small too, but yeah, um, is the first one. I hope it will be a second, third, bigger one. Uh, unfortunately, now discussions are more on other priority, but it's moving and it, 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 discussion is moving, has been moving at least about creating more, uh, Innovate, innovation and technology oriented policy in Peru. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have one of the things, and I'm sorry, I, I forgot to tell one of the things that, uh, so we have a big, uh, or more, maybe big is not the best word, an active, uh, innovation office called Innovate. They, uh, create, they have a program that's called Startup Peru, kind of some real, some similarities with the Startup Chile program. And they fund companies with uh, non-refundable funds, uh, tech companies. They, they give grants up to oh, 40K, from 15 to 40K, um, $1,000. And, um, and they also have other programs to support other actors of the ecosystem, like Angel Networks. They also give grants to Angel Networks. So, we have this agency, which has been very active, and I think the ecosystem wouldn't be what it is today without that agency. So that's, mm -hmm. again, another example how the government is acting toward stronger tech ecosystem. Yes. Then, if we would take a little prediction from your side, where is the ecosystem heading within the next 10 years? Do you see that in 10 years from now, what are the industri industries, the verticals that are booming and how much more capital roughly are going to be allocated on, a, on an annual basis? Yeah. Try to get that number, right? That's what everyone, everybody but wants. But you're, mani you're manifesting that to the future, basically now manifesting the, the, the number that it will become a reality. So 10 years from now, I think the whole ecosystem is going to be different, obviously. I mean, we will see bigger tech companies operating in Peru. Some of them will be Peruvian. Some of them will be from Latin. And mm -hmm. they will be the main actors in the local ecosystem. It's like taxi apps, right? I mean, now all the taxi apps, at least in Peru, we will have the three big actors. Uber from the U.S., Didi from China, Cabify from Spain. And they are the main actors in mobility on like mobility for like regular transportation. Um, I think that would happen in the financial market. It will happen in the, in the educational market, in the food market. And, and I think some of them will be Latin startups and all of them, other will be Peruvian startups ruling those markets. And I think the ecosystem then it will be completely different in the sense that 
we'll have this virtual cycle of tech companies investing in new tech companies. And that's where we need to get up to. We haven't closed fully the cycle. I mean, we need to start seeing successful founders investing in new startups and creating new ventures. And when you see that, you see it, it's a black and white change on the ecosystem. And um, we are getting to that point. I think we will get to that point for like four up to six years from now. And in 10 years, I will, I will imagine a different, a different rule, a different ecosystem. Talking about sizes, I don't know, probably a 10x again. And um, we will be a 1 billion venture market or even bigger. Sounds fantastic. I can't, I can't wait for that. And then if we sum, sum up a little bit of, of the, the challenges for the tech ecosystem still today is that you mentioned that there is not local funds, there is not overall funding that is sufficient to, to satisfy the demand for early stage, very early stage funding. That, that is very nascent. So the current state of the Peruvian ecosystem is that this is what is desperately needed pre a yes. cash. Yes. You know, one key success metric for startup is how much it takes for you to close a round, right? The shorter the time, really, the more successful you are. And, and also the less time you have to dedicate to start talking to pitching and talking to investors and you can dedicate more on your business, right? Yeah. And, and, and he, so we need more investment in early stages in order for founders to focus on the business and not waiting like six months to raise a hundred, uh, half a million. So it, I mean, you should be able to raise half a million in two months or even less. And, and that will be yeah. amazing. And that will speed up the whole ecosystem because you will see them racing and racing and growing and growing and, and, and that, and that's what we need right now. We need more funding on early stages. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then in, in 10 years, it's going to be going to the next stage. There's going to be the biggest pain point is going to be post A. I mean, you know, I, I went to, um, to a conference and one of the Spanish leaders, well, thing, one person was talking about the Spanish ecosystem, one of the leaders of Spanish ecosystem was saying, our problem is closing series B. <laughs> so they were, wow, we are so far away of that. I mean, yeah, it says our companies okay. cannot raise a billion and they have to move to relocate to other countries and that's affecting the Spanish ecosystem. I, I, it will be awesome if that will be our problem in Peru, but yeah, now we have like problems in the smaller market. And now you're building up the foundations for, for that future growth and, and building up the ecosystem. Uh, that's my role. That, yeah, that's my role. We define ourselves, although we are investors, we try to define ourselves as ecosystem builders. We want to make the Peruvian ecosystem stronger. And, and just to mention, I mean, again, you mentioned about international investors. Uh, it's very interesting that we have not only American, North American investors, or not only Latin American investors, we also have European investors already. Uh, investing in Peruvian startups. So there, I think there are a lot of opportunities for international investors in Peru and they, and, and I encourage who listen to the podcast to start looking for those opportunities. Thanks, Jose. I think that was a great final open invitation for people to come and, and, and join the growing tech ecosystem of Peru. Thanks a lot, Jose, for participating today. Thank you, Eric.